Well, hello, everybody. Welcome uh, at, or welcome back. Uh, thank you for being here today. Um, we just got off the tail end of a, I thought, a really good webinar on the TDS, the SPQ, the SPQA, and the AVID form um, just about two hours ago. So that was a lot of fun. We had a lot of people there. Um, and I want to thank you for being here today. We're going to talk about, uh, I actually did this uh, class a couple of weeks ago, but I have since revamped it. And so uh, I wanted you to get the benefit of that. Holly, hi, welcome back. Uh, Judy, hi. I missed you as CAR, Judy. Sorry about that. I guess I uh, just missed you. Patty's here. Sharon's here. Stephanie's here. Good. All right. So thank you, everybody, for being here today. I do appreciate your uh, your attendance and your loyalty. So we are at the Greater San Diego Association of Realtors, and my name is Kevin Burke, and there's my telephone number. There is my email address. Email is probably the easier way to get a hold of me, but then I just got off the phone with our IT guy, and he says, I don't know why you're not getting your emails, and I'm like, I got to get my emails, dude. I mean, it's really important. So anyway, he's looking into that, so it's not going to affect anything we're doing, but uh, it was an interesting conversation. So anyway, that being said, um, uh, here's some credentials, I guess, that that uh, make me qualified to speak about the subject. I've been in real estate for a long time. I mean, it's uh, since 1979. Maybe I should put that in there a set of 40 plus years, but I just figured I didn't have to go on to have to change it all the time. But but anyway, um, I do teach attorneys uh, real estate, uh, real property law. Uh, it's an ABA approved uh, course for continuing education for attorneys um, and uh, legal aspects of real estate. Everything I've done is all legal, but we're going to see in a second. I'm not an attorney, so I'm not interested in giving legal advice. I just teach people what the law says. So so uh, on the right hand column here, we've got all the, the chairs of this and the chairs of that. Needless to say, risk management is, is my thing, uh, has been for uh, quite some time. And so uh, um, uh, seeing you at the, yeah, thank you, Judy. Uh, yeah, we yeah we were able to hang out. Uh, Steve and I were able to hang out a little bit. So so anyway, um, rather than have a personal conversation while we're online here. Uh, so uh, lots of credentials, lots of good stuff. You know, as I always say, you know, awards are for things you've done in the past. You know, what are you doing today, right? That's all I really care about. So uh, we're going to be talking about stuff that's going to appear to be legal. I am clearly not a practicing attorney. I, I just don't have any interest. And in, in, I know a lot of attorneys and, and God knows they work harder than we do. Um, and uh, they put in a lot more hours, I think, than we do. And and, and uh, needless to say, I'm not intimidated. But, but then again, I have really good conversations with the Department of Real Estate. You know, I just, you know, all of this is part of the grand picture of consumer protection. So I do trial work. Okay. You, uh, DRE has said you may not call yourself an expert um, unless it's in a title. So be really careful about that, folks. You definitely don't want to call yourself the neighborhood expert or, or things like that because uh, it, you're going to get cooked. That's what's going to end up happening. It's not, never a good result. Uh, so don't call yourself those things. Um, but again, I'm calling myself an expert witness. I probably should change that to court certified expert witness because that's what I really am. So standard of care for real estate licenses mostly in the defense of brokerage firms, um, agents' duties of inspection and disclosure. And, and uh, this morning's class was, again, a lot about disclosure and, and, uh, and the AVID form and things like that and how to fill it out. And so, so if you want a copy of that, send me an email. Um, don't put it in here because I'm, I'm going to lose it after we turn it off. So uh, market conditions, at least in San Diego County, uh, conversation day not intended to be a substitute for the advice of your broker, nor for that of your attorney. Please consult with them as appropriate. I know we all can't have a Steve, but, uh, you know, your broker's uh, been there a while and they know what they're doing. And so you need to be uh, taking their advice. You're paying them to be there. So, you know, they're, they're a good person to listen to. Um, and as we know from our brokerage, uh, from Linda's brokerage, I don't have a brokerage, but from Linda's brokerage, we know that uh, uh, it's the people that we don't hear from that make us nervous. So, uh, so keep that in mind. Take good care of your broker. Make sure your broker's aware of what you're doing. Uh, keep them updated. Okay, so, so that's enough about that. Talk today is intended to be interactive. Please ask questions or offer input by utilizing the Q&A button. I 
do look forward to hearing from you. I'm just amazed as I do these webinars that that um, people ask such great questions. And, and so, you know, I really do welcome the questions. Sometimes people say, oh, I know this is a really dumb question, but then, you know, I'm going to run with that. I mean, it's probably a really good question and probably the, everybody else on the panel were, were, were thinking about the same thing. But but we're clearly getting enough people that it's, it's more than we can fit in a room. So, uh, you know, I want to answer your question. And if it looks like something that's not really on topic, then I'll, I'll divert it to a different time or whatever. But uh, sometimes it helps me shape the direction that we're going to take. I kind of already know where we're going to go today, but, but uh, you know, I'm always open to suggestions. So this morning, we did TDS, SPQ, SPQA, and Abbott. Those are the big ones. If I'm going to get hauled into court, it's going to be on one of those, you know, failure to disclose issues. Uh, today, disclosures, disclosures, disclosures. That's what it's all about. Those are three main words in real estate. It used to be location, location, location. Now it's disclose, disclose, disclose. So we're going to talk about the difference between statutory and contractual disclosures. And I'm going to tell you how important these things are. I've got transactions, uh, you know, in progress at the moment where, um, the broker doesn't understand uh, a lot about how disclosures work. Um, and of course, uh, they, they're they uh, too arrogant, I think, to ask the question. I'm here. To, I, I'll be happy to help people. But if they if they know everything, it's going to be really difficult to work with. So we'll, we'll be talking about a little bit about that today. So on Thursday, we're going to be doing first thing in the morning, 10 a.m. That's first thing in the morning for some people. I'm up at four, by the way. So call me as early as you want. Um, master my farm. I get to do my uh, presentation. And then and then in the afternoon, I've got my award winning presentation, how to how to create a winning listing presentation, how to get every listing that you want. You don't necessarily want all of them. So we'll talk about that on Thursday afternoon. Today, thank you for joining us for our discussion of disclosures, statutory or contractual. They are two completely different things. They have two completely different meanings, and they do different things in the real estate transaction. So again, I've redone this presentation. It's different than it was a couple of weeks ago, and it's clearly not the same as the uh, as the uh, all about disclosures that we did last week. So today's conversation will focus on disclosures in the residential residential real estate sales transaction, not commercial, sales. Um, uh, and by the way, in commercial, um, the, the it's amazingly less in disclosures, but then we got more lawyers. And so, you know, almost everybody's represented by counsel on the commercial side of things. And so um, we, we tend to find not as much, uh, not as many problems. But when I tell somebody you need to talk to counsel about that, I'm serious about talking to counsel. Okay, so we're going to talk about those required by the seller, um, but also those required uh, of the real estate agent. And so what's my statutory disclosure? Why are they required? Uh, in California, um, we, we have a, a rule that says uh, um, that there's no buyer beware. In, in California, it's caveat vendor, which is seller beware, um, versus a class I did uh, literally an hour and a half ago in Virginia, where the where they have no disclosures. I mean, as they do, the state of Virginia gives them a disclosure form. Actually, that class was in West Virginia, but uh, the state gives a form for the disclosure. It's already printed out. It's ready to go. Um, and and the uh, the agents really they they think that they don't have to disclose anything, but but that's not true. And by the way, in a transaction like I was referring to earlier, where the the seller could be exempt, TDS exempt, they still must disclose what they knew or should have known. They just aren't required to use the form. Um, they still have to disclose that they knew about something. Um, and the agent is never exempt. So, uh, you know, you're subject to civil code 2079. So I'm going to throw a bunch of civil codes at you, a bunch of government codes and, and health and safety and all these things. So we're going to talk about those today. And again, if you want a copy of this presentation, please let me know. Give it about an hour after I'm done. They got to take all my bad language out of it. But uh, give it about an hour after I'm done and then uh, it'll it'll start uh becoming, it'll make sense. And I'll send you everything I've got. So um, that being said, again, California, let the seller beware. Um, where and what are required? So on the East Coast versus the West Coast, as I've said uh, previously, and I'm a broker in, in uh, on both coasts. And so, you know, California disclosed everything. You know, Virginia, you know, don't don't say nothing, you know, that kind of thing. So and people actually believe that it's not true. So why are they required? So let's talk about the seller. The reason why disclosures are required of a seller 
is to ensure that those with the most knowledge of the property share that information with the buyer. And, and so we're going to talk about the about the uh, Easton case here shortly. Um, and I'm going to give you I'm going to show you that as an example of what I'm talking about. So the standard of care, which I do trial work on for the seller is new or should have known. Either they knew about it or they should have known about it, right? You've got a water bill. Well, I can't really say that. In Del Mar, my water bill is $385 a month. Um, and, uh, and some people would think that that's high, but that's a normal water bill when you're living, you know, at the ocean in, in uh, Del Mar. Um, but if you're, you know, if your electric bill is $3,000, then, you know, then you might want to be questioning that, that maybe that's a trigger that you should have known something was wrong. So what about the agent? The agent, to assure that the real estate professional does their due diligence in the real estate transaction. And I'm quoting, by the way, the Department of Real Estate. This is their position on things. The real estate licensee has an obligation to provide those forms necessary for their client. And remember, your client is someone you have a contract with. The uh, purchase agreement does not create a contract between yourself uh, and the person that you're working uh, for or with. Um, it, it's the employment agreement. So the listing agreement or the buyer representation agreement. Hold on to your hat, folks. You you know, by this time at the end of the year, uh, I, I suspect that California will make it a requirement. You must have a buyer representation agreement. In other states where I teach, they already do require it. Uh, you, you have to have a contractual relationship with your client in order to avoid a lot of the problems. When you define your duty, you limit your liability. Remember that. So, so it's really important that you have those uh, written agreements between yourself and the and the person that you're purporting to be uh, their agent. So, um, so by virtue of your license, and again, this comes from the Department of Real Estate, the real estate licensee is authorized to explain the standard forms. So people tell me all the time, they say, well, I don't want to, I, I can't explain the forms. I say, why not? They say, well, because that's legal advice. I go, no, it's not. Um, you have a license and, and the Department of Real Estate has made it really clear that, that your license allows you to be able to explain the standard form, not legal advice, not writing new forms. You know, anything you write is always going to be legal advice, right? Okay. Um, and by the way, if you don't have a written agreement with a, with a buyer or a seller, then the advice you give them is legal advice. So you want to be careful about that. Okay. So other than that, uh, for the agent, reasonably competent, diligent, visual inspection, uh, uh, whoops, where to go, uh, reasonably competent, and diligent visual inspection, and to disclose to a prospective purchaser any facts that affect the value or desirability of the property that such an investigation would reveal, again, straight out of the commissioner's handbook. Uh, and, uh, uh, and and I think I'll send you that too, if you want to just ask for it. Um, but, but I'm going to tell you, it's really, really important. And so, you know, it, it's one thing to get hauled into court for something that uh, because you didn't do something, it's another thing to have to defend your real estate license, because essentially that's your, your livelihood. And, and, and they understand that. So, uh, um, so we need to take that seriously. So let's talk about Easton. So the Easton case was a famous case that came out of, uh, and this is again, not, this is a class about disclosures, this is not a class uh, uh, necessarily about um, uh, knowing how to do these forms. So, um, but the but the Easton case. Let's talk about. I'm just really quick. wanted wanted to go over it with you. Easton uh, Easton v. Strasburger. So um, the the seller sells the house to the buyer. The seller and the agents were aware of slippery soils. There were problems with the property. And sure enough, after the closing of the transaction, after the settlement occurred, um, there was a failure. The, the slope failed and went down, crashed, and did all kinds of, of bad bad stuff. Okay, So um, unfortunately, the court held that they were aware of it. Now, this is before your AVID. This is before, really, 2079. I mean, uh, Civil Code 2079. So you'll notice up here at the top, uh, it was the third, whoops, wrong way, third, it was the uh, um, California Court of Appeal, a third district, okay? Um, and so unfortunately for, for the world at that point, um, they published this opinion. When they published the opinion uh, from the Court of Appeal, most people can't go up above the Court of Appeal because by the time you get to the Court of Appeal, you've got millions of dollars in, into this thing. And, and so to try now to leapfrog up into the Supremes um, is going to be incredibly expensive. Um, and so um, the and again, I'm not going to go deep into the case, but it's very relevant for where we are today as far as our obligation to uh, do uh, our uh, due diligence. Okay, so this is 
First Appellate District, Division Two. Um, anyway, published. It's in Cal Reporter. It got published. So now it is the law of the land in California. Okay. And that's the Easton case. All right. And so, uh, again, failure to disclose material facts affecting the value or desirability of the property. So let's take a look. So that was Easton. Um, and that was the precursor to Civil Code 2079, which um, which uh, I can tell you, I know a lot about 2079, uh, and that is our, our obligations at law to disclose things, uh, things like that. Okay, so a real estate licensee, so that was a real estate licensee has a duty to disclose to a buyer material defects known to the broker. So if the agent knows something, then then they need to say something about it. So, but unknown to and unobservable by the buyer. So the agent doesn't necessarily have to disclose those things that are readily available, readily apparent. And, and then we get into latent versus patent defects, you know, things like that. Was it something that somebody would, would know on a visual inspection? My advice is disclose everything, put it all in writing, because you might end up having to defend that later. Okay, so um, so again, un unknown to and unobservable by the buyer, um, if a broker fails to disclose known material facts, and I emphasize the word known, and that was my emphasis because you had to know about it. Now, some people are going to say, "Well, I'll just pretend like I don't know about it," or. I won't tell them the truth. I just won't tell them about it at all. And so the problem with that is that now you get into either intentional misrepresentation or negligent misrepresentation. So intentional misrepresentation means you intended to deceive someone. Um, fraud is a much bigger issue than intentional misrepresentation. But negligent misrepresentation is that you either misrepresented something that you really didn't know the true facts about it, but you stated it as if it was a fact, um, but, but also you may not have intended to deceive somebody, whereas in intentional misrepresentation, you absolutely wanted to do that. So again, known. And so if you want to sit back and say, well, I got to prove I knew about it, uh, remember, if it elevates to the, the situation of fraud, um, the return on fraud is huge. It's much larger than most any other returns. Uh, a little more difficult to prove, but if they can prove it to the jury, uh, you're going to have an issue. So uh, broker fails to disclose known material facts, he or she is liable for fraudulent concealment or for negligent misrepresentation. Okay, everybody okay so far? Uh, hopefully, I haven't taken everybody's breath away. Um, let's talk about Field versus Century 21 Cloud and Furness. It imposes a greater fiduciary duty uh, on, on the selling, otherwise known as the buyer's agent. So let's take a look at that. We're going to go up here. We're at Field. Um, and so the Field case came out of uh, Otay Mesa. This was a, a case, uh, uh, and, and this was only partially um, – Thank God, this is only partially published. Uh, actually, I'm not sure if that was that's a good thing or not. So again, as I said earlier, if they publish the result, if they publish their opinion on it, then essentially it becomes the law of the land. And most of these people don't have the wherewithal the resources to kick it up to the Supremes. And so this is as far as it gets, and then they publish it. And so this case, again, certified for partial publication, Court of Appeal, Fourth Appellate, uh, Division I, State of California. So here's the, you know, the plaintiff are the field. Uh, they bought the property. Um, the agent represented them, um, and, and they became the defendants in this case. And so, you know, I don't know. There's there's two things that that uh, that my understanding that people are afraid of, um, that we're afraid of lawyers and we're afraid of the de Department of Real Estate. And I'm going to tell you that a lot of that goes hand in hand. Um, the lawyers are going to split things up, um, and and uh, and you know depositions are uh, are a very uh, exacting, a very uh, toll extracting um, uh, uh, thing to go through. I personally enjoy them, but um, that's because I like to have fun when I go in there, and people are just like, "What is wrong with you?" But you know, at the end of the day, you know, I want to make sure that you know people aren't getting away with stuff. So, and I'm talking about the attorneys, right? So, anyway, this is uh, Superior Court of San Diego County. This was this was the appeal was from Superior Court of San Diego County, uh, uh, Judge Hollywood, um, and it was an, and it was affirmed which means uh, the court held that the judge was right, you know, about the case. And so, uh, um, 
Let me go through a bunch of stuff. I'm not like again. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but uh, the, but the real case here was not the real case was statute of limitations case. Okay, so there's two years statute of limitations that, that's established by 2079, and they say it did not apply to claims for a breach of fiduciary duty brought against the brokers by purchasers whom they exclusively represented. Okay, so so then they go into the facts, and then here's the agent. I think Shirley is actually still practicing. Uh, Cloud and Furness went down as a result of this, um, uh, but they, here they were appealing the judgment awarding damages to the field, uh, the, the buyer, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, buyer of the property, um, and again, it was rural property, so again, I'm not going to go deep, but but the um, essentially what happened was the city of Otay Mesa had the ability of an easement on the property that said that they could dump the water tank on the adjoining property, which was subsequently flood this property. So, you know, that arguably that information was contained in the um, preliminary title report. Problem was the buyer didn't get the preliminary title report until after the, the transaction had settled or closed. And so you can only imagine that you're going through the title report a week after you bought this uh, lovely home. And, and it says, uh, they can pump the bilges or dump the bilges on the neighboring property and flood your property. And so, um, uh, so you know, and again, Century 21 didn't argue that the evidence of breach was insufficient, but uh, challenges the court trial court's failure to find the fields. You know, they wanted it to be a statute of limitations case. And the court said, no, we're not going to hold that, you know, that, that uh, time bar to it. So, so again, you know, preliminary title report, very, very important thing. Um, uh, again, uh, there's no law that requires one. I, I have uh, a, a conversation going on right now with a broker where the buyer is paying cash and, uh, and the broker has told them that they don't need to have a title report um, because there's no law that requires it. So, you know, uh, um, it just makes sense. It's good to do, and and uh, everybody does it. It's easy to get one. It's not that complicated, um, and you don't pay for it unless you use it. So uh, it's just the way that it is. So so anyway, I want to show you the field case again. This is very lengthy, and we're not going to go through all this. But uh, if you send me an email, I will be happy to send you um, a copy of that uh, of that case. Okay. So uh, um, so the agent standard of care. Licensee must use the degree of care that a reasonably prudent real estate licensee would exercise and is measured by the degree of knowledge through education, experience, and examination required to obtain a real estate license. And that was from, I'd like to think of him as a friend, uh, uh, Wayne Bell, who was the previous commissioner. I've been kind of friendly with most all the commissioners, um, uh, including the current commissioner. Uh, you know, listen, these it's a it's a political position, um, and when uh, there was a shift in the power, um, uh, you know, Wayne Bell lost his position and actually went on to do other stuff. And so uh, uh, he was an attorney. He headed up the uh, enforcement division of the Department of Real Estate for uh, 20 years that I knew him. Um, and, uh, and you know, it's not like we're pen pals or anything, but I do uh, communicate with him from time to time. A super, super guy. So anyway, I think that, uh, I, you know, listen to his words. Yeah, I, and, and part of what he is saying is, don't be bringing outside stuff. So I talked to an agent this morning who says, you know, I'm a general contractor. And I said, well, which one are you, a contractor or a real estate agent? And he says, like, you know, what's the difference? And I said, well, you, you need to make sure you're wearing a real estate agent hat when you're talking to people about real estate. Don't be talking about your contractor stuff um, and vice versa. So, you know, I've got my lawyer hat, you know, my non-practicing lawyer hat on. I don't give people legal advice. I am really quick to kick people up the food chain to the attorneys. I've got a, we have an approved vendor list in our office. And, and literally I, I kick people up to the, you know, th that level, I'll send them the list. I'll say here, pick one, go talk to them. I've, I know, I know them all personally, and uh, they, they're all good at what they do. Qualified California real estate attorney, otherwise known as a QCREA and CAR coined that term about nine months ago without really knowing what they were uh, doing, but uh, they coined it and they, it's stuck. And I think it's a, a great thing. Uh, I know I talked to Bill Jansen and other people that are big, big attorneys that, and, and we kind of like the use of that language. Okay. So, so some of these things even have the potential of costing you your real estate license, and we don't want that to happen. So what is the difference? And the difference is, here's my statutory disclosure contains rescission rights. Rescission is a very powerful word at law. Um, rescission says, 
put the parties back in the position that they were in prior to the creation of the contract. Now think about that for a second. So, you know, you put a contract together and then everybody's worried about the deposit, right? Well, statutory rights say, no, we're just going to reset everything. We're just going to put everything back the way it was before the contract. So, you know, we, we rarely see arguments, you know, uh, disputes at trial over a rescission right. If somebody rescinds a contract, then, then, you know, that's a very powerful term. Right. So um, and we're going to talk about some of those. We'll talk about rescission rights later on. We'll talk about contractual rights. OK, so so with contract, you have cancellation rights. Well, that just that's something we can fight about. Can't really fight about a rescission right. So what are some of the things that that, you know, we have um, that are um, attached to rescission rights? And and one of those things, of course, is the granddaddy of all of them. And that's the disclosure regarding real estate agency relationship. And it's, there's no S on the end of that, okay? Even though the, the purchase agreement is incorrect, it says relationships, but only people like me would figure that part out. But that's Civil Code 2079. So again, the first form your client should ever sign. All right, so let's go ahead. I want to take a look. I've actually opened up the program. So I'm in uh, disclosures. Here's my disclosures template. And so I want to take a look at my statutory disclosures. And uh, here's the, the again, the granddaddy of all of them. This is my agency disclosure form. I chose to do this one live, even though I've downloaded all of these forms. Uh, question. Um, oh, Dolly, hi. Does RPA have three-day right of rescission like most other contracts? Um, the, the law has a three-day right of rescission. It can be three days, five days, depending on what in particular we're talking about. Um, but but three days is the standard for the law. So all the RPA does is, is remind you that you have that. And if you look at the bottom of the uh, TDS, for example, on the bottom of page three, you will see that it says it again. It says that you know you have the buyer has rescission rights. So um, and, and by the way, I want to make it clear that that those rescission rights are going to attach to statutory disclosures. So um, they can get they can get out of the transaction based on that. Not not um, they can get out of the transaction for any reason for 17 days. I just go crazy when somebody says that. But but again, the rescission rights only apply to those disclosed statutory disclosures that are made after the parties come to come to agreement on the contract. So this is one of the reasons why when, when we take a listing, we have all of the disclosures signed by the seller, completed and signed by the seller. We sit down with the seller and, and, and they complete all of the disclosures prior to um, the offer coming in. So when the offer comes in, we get an offer. Well, we help the seller create a counter offer and we send all the disclosures along with the counter offer to the seller uh, prior to the buyer obviously committing to the contract. And so buyer gets in. So here, here's the, the principle behind that. First of all, they don't have rescission rights, right? Because they got the they got the, the statutory disclosures prior to them agreeing to buy the property. So the courts have said, you know, you knew what you were buying. You signed a document that, that you signed off on all these disclosures. And so we're not going to allow the contract contract, you know, to be uh, uh, you to rescind the contract because you knew what you were buying and rescission rights only attach if those disclosures are made after the contract comes together. OK, so so Dolly, great question. Um, again, a statutory right. The, the purchase agreement just tells them what's in there. So uh, I'm hoping you can see the disclosure. So this is the first one. This is my agency disclosure. And we're not going to pull up all the forms. We're going to find that there's going to be a bunch of forms that we really can't pull up because there aren't any forms. Um, but this is the first one. And this is this is my poster child. This is the one if I'm going to go to court, this is uh, this is going to be why I'm going to go to court. And that's because the agent has a, a duty. Uh, and I can't say the word duty in court because that's the judge's job. Um, but the, you have an obligation to uh, protect your client. And that's covered by Civil Code 2079. Remember the Easton case? So this is this is protected by Civil Code 2079. So I've highlighted it there on your screen. Um, and you will notice that the end, the uh, revision date up here is 1221. Um, so we've revised this form for the first time in well over a dozen years in October of uh, 2018. Um, and then and then we decided to rewrite the purchase agreement uh, so that you know it as you see it today, or that it's in a grid. Um, and so we we wrote that uh, new purchase agreement in December of 21, but we'd already experienced the fact that we were so good at changing the statute 
that we went ahead and changed it again. And so, uh, so that's why this doesn't say October of 21. This says uh, December, of, uh, I'm sorry, October of 18. It says December of 21. So some of the key changes were we're not going to call them the listing agent anymore. We're going to call them the seller's agent. We're not going to call them the buy, the uh, selling agent anymore. We're going to call them the buyer's agent. And those are kind of important concepts because remember that the, the law says in order to be able to enforce the agreement, it must be written in plain English. And so I always say, you know, it has to be written in the Queen's English. And of course, you know, my broker, Linda, corrected me on that. She looked it up and she says, it's not the Queen's English. I said, yeah, I know, but people understand what I'm talking about. You know, it was written so that they could understand it. And that's why we rewrote the purchase agreement the way that we did. Um, and then we also had the legislate. We, we convinced the legislative body to also change the statutory language in Civil Code 2079. So quite an accomplishment. I mean, CAR has figured out how to create their own legislation. They're a very powerful lobby. Um, and so they create it. And as the Department of Real Estate says, you know, we enforce the law. And so whatever you create, we're going to we're going to probably enforce it. So uh, um so this is the first one. It talks about dual agency. You know what happens when we're representing both. Dual agency is okay. Um, we, you know, it's a defensible position. I've defended it before uh, with other brokerage firms. Um, we have attorneys in our office who are practicing agents. Uh, in Linda's office, I don't have an office, but um, they're practicing agents, and and they just won't represent both sides. They just can't. In their brain, they've been it's been drilled into their head that how can you not have a conflict of interest? But in in our world in real estate, we actually get consent from the buyer and seller to allow dual representation. So, for example, we have a form. And that's called the PRBS. That's the possible representation of more than one buyer and seller. And so that form is the form that, that the uh, buyer and the seller sign that gives consent for us to be dual agents in a transaction. In other states, for example, in Virginia, um, you know, they do it later. So literally, um, if you're going to write it, if you're representing a buyer and you're going to write an offer on a listing that is uh, listed by your brokerage firm, then you have to get the buyer to sign again, agreeing to consent to the dual agency relationship. And so they actually have a form for that. Hi, Miriam. They actually have a form for that. And, and so the buyer can refuse to uh, allow the uh, agent to be a dual agent in the transaction. They can actually refuse that to happen. So uh, Robert, thank you for your very kind message today. Um, thank you and thank you for being here. So anyway, so we have the agency disclosure, which remember the law says we must disclose the concept of agency. So that's where this comes from, okay? But remember then too, we also must, we also must confirm agency. And that's the part that was missing from the RPA for so many years years because you know it was it was buried back on paragraph number 17 and so uh Veronica Kilpatrick who is the district manager for the Department of Real Estate and anytime Veronica says something I'm listening I'm writing it down right um and she says you know y'all had it buried back there on paragraph number 17 nobody was completing it so you never really did confirm agency so that's why I stress on how important that is the uh, agency disclosure has to happen uh, prior to uh, you doing anything that requires, uh, you know, agency, right? So you must disclose the concept of agency. But once you've written, and so as the seller's agent, we know we're currently in single agency, right? Um, if as a buyer's agent, we know we're in single agency, but it's not until the buyer's agent is going to write an offer on a property that is listed by the buyer's agent's broker, the agent being uppercase A. So in our case, that's Linda. So uppercase A. So when you're writing an offer on a listing that is, uh, held by um, your brokerage firm, you're you're doing dual agency. And, and again, in Virginia, they won't allow you to do it uh, until you get further consent. And so it does happen where the buyer says, no, nah, I just can't trust it. It's too close. You know, I'm going to want to uh, talk to have another broker write my offer and they can't stop from doing it. Okay. So that's my disclosure. We confirm agency in paragraph number two of the purchase agreement. Um, and so, um, and, and so it's frequently done, you know, the, the paragraph number two, for example, our, our name in paragraph number two, our name is truncated in the MLS, so it shows up as a um, 
as a, uh, what do you call it, uh, you know, one great big long word, which creates a problem for us. So, so we literally have to, if the agent doesn't know enough to put spaces in there, um, then we have to do what's called the confirmation of agency relationships. Um, and that's uh, going to be the CAR form uh, AC. Uh, let me see if I can pull that up for you really quick because I want to show that to you. So that's that's in those situations where the name was spelled wrong or or the DRE number is missing. That's the most common thing I see. The, the uh, DRE number was missing from the, um, um, there it is, uh, DRE number was missing uh, from the uh, offer on paragraph number two. So here's my confirmation of real estate agency relationships. Again, you're only using this if paragraph number two wasn't filled out properly on the purchase agreement, paragraph 2B specifically. Okay, so you can see it's the same kind of stuff, but this gives the seller's agent an opportunity to correct what the offer itself may have looked like. Okay, so uh, that being said, that's essentially the basis behind that form. Same kind of stuff, the seller's brokerage information, the seller's agent, buyer's brokerage information, the buyer's agent, and, and then we're off to the races, okay? So that's the purpose behind that form. Okay, so that's probably I'm boring you to death, although I have to, I do have to thank uh, one of our listeners who, who uh, um, sent me a, an email and said, can you discuss... Can you do a class on agency? And so I don't know how many people would be interested in that, but uh, the concept is fascinating to me. And, and again, I'm looking at it globally and, and certainly from 30,000 feet up, but but uh, I'm happy to do it. I'm going to put that in front of the um, education committee, education department at uh, SDAR and see if they'll authorize me to do that for them. But again, a lot of the courses that I've been creating, I'm now starting to kick those up to the Department of Real Estate to get uh, DRE approval for continuing education credit. So uh, they currently have the RPA in front of them. I had a, an amazing, uh, amazingly good conversation with them on Monday. And uh, so I'm very excited about that. So uh, in fact, they said, we're looking forward to your view on what the RPA says. So I was pretty proud of that. So, so again, the AD form, the disclosure regarding real estate agency relationships, first form your client should ever sign. You may not move forward with someone without it. Okay. And always give them a copy. Uh, and then I showed you the confirmation of real estate agency relationship. And that's also 2079.13. Uh, as sequitur means and following. Uh, you don't have to be good to Latin, in Latin to go to law school, although I did have four years of Latin in high school. So it did help. Um, but again, only if, if it wasn't done properly on page two of the RPA. Or I'm sorry, this should say paragraph two of the RPA. Okay, so um, then we get into another really interesting one. So this is going to be the EPA, the lead paint disclosure. Um, and again, it applies to pre-78 housing. And so something I want to say about this, this is not a law. Technically speaking, it's not a statutory disclosure, but it has the full force and effect of law because what the EPA does is they don't go to the legislative body and say, here, we want to create this new law. They just say, we're going to call it a regulation. Kind of like the commissioner's regulations, you know, for us, it has the full force and effect of law, but it's really, it's not a statutory disclosure, but, uh, but, but understand this, it's real important in 49 of the 50 states, the, the law, the regulation requires that the, that the, uh, uh, the disclosure of potential lead paint uh, be made to the buyer prior to the contract even being written. So we'll find it to be page one. Of a lot of those uh, of a lot of those forms that they have guess which state got away with not having to do that and it has to do with the way that we write our contracts so we go under contract which uh which is you know at that point uh equitable title has passed to the buyer but they don't get legal title until it closes or settles and so so that's why we're able to get away with not having to make the disclosure prior to the contract being created, but we absolutely need to have it done uh, prior to the uh, the settlement or the uh, uh, closing. So we have a form for that. It's the CAR form LPD. Let me pull that up here really quick, just so you can see what it looks like. Uh, if you haven't seen it before, I'm a little surprised, but again, only need to have this 
um, in uh, pre-1978 housing. It applies to sales and rentals. So now remember, you must in all transactions, purchases, sales, whatever, still do the environmental hazards disclosure, which includes lead-based paint in your home. So you have an obligation to make those disclosures in all real estate transactions. It's just that if the property was built before 1978, then this is going to apply. Okay. And so something to keep in mind is uh, that you have uh, the uh, the new rule, which has to do with lead paint renovation, right? And that new rule says that if you, uh, if you uh, destroy more than six square feet of lead-based paint in a room or uh, more than 20 square feet on the exterior, then you must make uh, you must have a, a, a qualified professional actually do the work on the property. So that enforcement began in 2010, folks. So if you weren't aware of it, that was 13 years ago. So again, you can go to the EPA's website and that's, uh, uh, and, and I say that and I always have to mention and I have seen um, the videos of, of how um, what happens to a child that eats lead paint, and and it's uh, it's a horrible thing to see. It does permanent, irreversible brain damage, uh, and it, and it's uh, it's just horrible. So there are videos of it on YouTube. It's not a laughing matter, um, and it is they take it very seriously. So this is my uh, disclosure, uh, the seller's disclosure. Again, you know, have you, are you aware of it, if it's in there or not? If the seller's not aware of lead-based paint, they have to still use the form, but if they're not aware of it, then they don't they really have much to say about that. So they have no reports or, or, or records of anything. Uh, remember that the buyer's got 10 days um, uh, to do an assessment. We're gonna talk about that in just a second. So the seller certifies that the information is correct. And then the buyer, uh, sorry, then the seller's agent, we still haven't changed this language. The seller's agent acknowledges it. Then the buyer or the tenant acknowledges it. Um, and then down here is uh, they, they acknowledge they have a right to a 10-day assessment for sale only, not for tenancy. But they can waive that right. They can they can have less time for it. They can do a lot of different things. So so then then the cooperating agent, usually known as the buyer's agent, would sign as well. Okay, and so that's my lead paint disclosure. Uh, let me uh, take us back to the PowerPoint. Um, so uh, uh, I, I cite again. I put the citations in here if you're interested. Uh, CFR's Code of Federal Regulations. Um, so anyway, I put all this in here in case you wanted to look something up. Um, and then finally, uh, it, it can be up to two, $200,000 per offense. It used to be 11000 So, uh, but, you know, I was on the, uh, you know, in, in researching the information for this uh, uh, webinar, you know, it, it, apparently it has increased to two hundred. could be up to $200,000 uh, per offense. So, uh Violators uh, may face civil and or criminal penalties. So if you have a criminal accusation on it, in other words, you've just done it too many times or you were aware of it, you still continue to do it, then uh, you you will not have e and o coverage for the um, for the action, okay? So uh, um, e your E&O doesn't cover criminal acts. That's just that simple, okay? So um, you, you also have a potential of treble, what would they call treble damages or uh, three times the amount of, uh, of the penalty in, the, in a private civil suit. Um, sellers must provide the homeowners a 10-day period to conduct the assessment. Um, parties may mutually agree in, write, in writing now to lengthen or shorten the time period. And then finally, the home buyer may waive the inspection opportunity altogether. Okay, so that's my lead paint disclosure. Now I get to talk about my TDS. I love the TDS. So TDS is really cool. So uh, uh, a great source of revenue for me. I don't want it to be a, a source of uh, loss of revenue for you. So let's take a look at the transfer disclosure statement. Um, and so um, so it came up in this morning's class, and, and I have a transaction where the seller thinks that they are TDS exempt. Uh, remember, there are very few exceptions to the uh, transfer disclosure uh, law, Civil Code 1102.3 specifically, uh, very few. Uh, and, and so I think sometimes agents hear the term trust and they figure all trusts are exempt. Well, that's not the case. So um, uh, all trusts are not exempt. Very few trusts are, in fact. 
In fact, the number of exempt parties is is pretty limited. So if I were to if I were to go down to my exempt seller disclosure form, uh, this is my exempt seller disclosure. You know, use use by sellers who are exempt from completing the TDS or somebody just refuses to provide the SPQ. And so you see this whole great big explanation of it. The, here's the stuff that uh, they still have to disclose. Um, remember, an exemption from the TDS just means that you don't have to use the form itself. You don't have to use the TDS form. The law still requires that if you have knowledge, you must disclose the, that knowledge, okay? So, um, so anyway, here's a whole list of stuff that does not fall under the purview of the TDS, like for example, death of an occupant of the property upon the property, not bedroom number two, but the four corners of the property. Um, you know, that's not included in the transfer disclosure statement. So we added it in as a, not only as an exempt seller disclosure, but also um, in our SPQ, you'll see that it's at the top. These, this whole thing is a stamp that goes on the top of, of the uh, SPQ. So they still have to make the disclosures, uh, making it very clear that uh, these are the things that they're required to do, whether uh, if, if they're claiming the exemption. So here's how we handle it in a real estate transaction where somebody claims an exemption. And, and again, and I probably know better than a lot of people whether or not they really are exempt. So, but we want to protect ourselves and we want to protect our buyer. So what we do is we ask for, you know, the uh, TDS, the SPQ, the SPQA, um, and uh, we get an email back that says, we're not going to give it to you, we're exempt. So then we wait a couple of days, we send a, a request again, um, and then they get fired back, you know, uh, hey, we told you we're exempt. And then, and then this is usually the agent telling us this. So that's going to be suspect already. But but uh, and then the third time we send it over, we get the hey, stupid, you know, I told you we're exempt. Um, and again, remember what I said earlier, the agent is never exempt um, and the seller is probably not exempt. Um, highly likely the seller is not exempt. Um, and so, but we're going to put those emails, we're going to have the buyer sign the emails uh, and we're going to put them in the file so that we can defend ourselves from our own buyer when it comes to find out that the seller is in fact not TDS exempt. So, uh, um, and as I've always said, you know, don't let somebody else's arrogance or bravado or whatever impact your uh, your uh, suspicions about whether or not they're exempt or not. Assume by default they're not exempt, um, and then and then again they have an obligation to give you the trust documents, things like that, uh, and and uh, um, they're still going to have the disclosure requirements. So, um, okay, all right. So we covered the uh, ES uh, ESD form. Let's uh, move on. Uh, we're doing pretty good here today, actually. So, um, so oh, that's right. I'm sorry, my TDS. So let's talk about the TDS really quick. Uh, TDS, clearly one of my favorite forms. Um, uh, as I said in the beginning of this, if you're going to go to court, this is probably how you got there. So uh, almost never filled out properly. I, again, I did a much more exhaustive review of the TDS this morning, but but um, you know you're going to fill in the top part, um, and then the date is the date is going to be the date that the uh, the seller completed the document. Um, the, but later on, the, so the Department of Real Estate came out with a regulation recently that says that they're going to consider the date to be the date that the parties went under contract. So if you filled this out, a, year, a seller filled this out a year ago, um, and now you're just now putting it under contract, um, the Department of Real Estate says, we're going to hold you to how the property was at the time of contract, even if that's inconsistent with what the TDS says. So, so what do I do with a TDS? Well, since TDS is a statutory disclosure, again, California Civil Code, here it is 1102. So since it is a statutory disclosure, the seller is going to complete it. But if they have to change anything or if anything happens, so somebody asked me a really good question this morning, how old can the TDS be? Well, the TDS... I would not do the TDS back before December of 21, right? Because it was a different TDS. And so you want to use the current form. So as long as the form hasn't changed and the TDS is less likely to change than most any form because it is, again, requires legislative approval. So, so if the seller needs to make an amendment to the TDS, they just go to the addendum form and the addendum form will allow them to address the, the modifications. And then again, that form is also going to have an admonition 
admonition in there that says that uh, you know you you could be modifying the TDS and you might be increasing the buyer's rescission rights and things like that. So I'm looking for that uh, form and I'm not finding it readily. So I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it. Okay, so my TDS again, um, the paragraph number one, um, CAR wrote a really good Q&A on substituted disclosures. So uh, that's the basis behind this. Um, but the legislative body added this paragraph, whoops, this paragraph down at the bottom that says, you know, no substituted disclosures for this transfer. And if you read the Q&A by CAR, you'll see that it says pretty much, um, you know, this is probably going to be the box the seller is going to check, but you do not ever want to fill out a TDS on behalf of the seller. If the seller is unable to fill it out, have a family, one of their family, not your family member, one of their family members fill it out and complete it, whatever, but you don't want to touch it or go anywhere near that. You want to make sure that it is, this is the seller's disclosure. And so, again, one of the problems that we had in our industry back when this form first, uh, uh, first came out was real estate agents were completing it themselves. And the problem with that is, of course, that that makes it your disclosure, not the seller's. So my advice would be to have the seller complete the form uh, and, uh, and you just back away from it, okay? So your job is to advise and counsel. So you have an obligation to either sit with the seller and help them complete the form or get online somehow, do a Zoom or a Teams or a Meet, you know, something where you can uh, go over it with the seller. I'd probably even record it because you want to be able to prove that you went over it with the seller. That's going to be your best defense. Okay, but not just give them the form and say, here, you know, complete the form. And if you have any questions, just let me know. That is not going to be a good defense. Okay. All right. Uh, that being said, seller's information on uh, the second part, second section of all this. Um, this is where the seller states whether they're occupying the property or not. And so, you know, like I said this morning, you know, we get into conversations, well, I'm only in it for three months out of the year. I think that constitutes occupying it. I don't know if there's a a benchmark that says after a certain period of time, you know, you qualify as occupying the property. I would probably, if the seller has spent any time in it, I would probably have them uh, uh, answer that they, that they are occupying the property. So paragraph number A down here, uh, so this is 2A, um, uh, the seller is going to complete those items that are included in the transfer, knowing that down at the bottom of the page, it's going to say, are there, to the best of your knowledge, any of the above that are not in operating condition? Yes or no. And if you answer yes, then you're going to have to explain it, okay? So you can explain it either in, in this brief period, or you can explain it uh, on the, on the uh, separate addendum form, okay? All right. In fact, I don't know if... Let me see here whether or not, did, oh, did I say I, didn't, I don't have the addendum in here? I don't think I have the addendum in here. Let's pull up the addendum. I want to show you, there's the addendum. So no, I do not have it in there. So let's pull that up. And so again, not a statutory form, but if the seller has stuff to talk about that wasn't to be able to be covered on the TDS itself, they can always use this form. And so notice up here, um, uh, the following terms and conditions are hereby incorporated in a part of the purchase agreement or transfer disclosure statement. See right there, transfer disclosure statement. Note an amendment to the TDS may give uh, the buyer the right to, res to rescind, right? So, so that's why I checked that box and put the date of the TDS in there and then we're off to the races. So I've documented the, the uh, additional disclosures or whatever else was necessary. Uh, question. Uh, do historical inspections reports fall under the additional inspection reports box? I'm not sure if I understand that question. Uh, inspections from when the seller purchased. Oh, yes. So, um, so you know, it's interesting. That's a really good question. So when I was management at uh, the, certainly the largest real estate company in San Diego, um, you know, we had a warehouse full of disclosures. Every time we sold a house, we would put the disclosures, you know, we would index them, put the disclosures in a warehouse. We had a warehouse full of disclosures. And so whenever we sold the house again, whenever the listing came up or we were a buyer's agent or a seller's agent, we would pull that disclosure out of archives. And so you're saying historical disclosures, and I'm going to agree with you. I think you should. Uh, always have that uh, in the file. And so uh, uh, plaintiff's counsel will find out pretty quickly whether you 
were involved in the previous sale of the property or not. So they usually call people like me. Um, so good, good question. That's what my addendum can do. Uh, back to my TDS. So uh, at the top of, uh, so at the bottom of page one is the box. Are you the seller uh, aware of any significant defects or malfunctions in any of the following? Yes or no. So uh, it is a required answer. You either answer yes or you answer no. Um, no answer is going to be uh, is going to create a defective TDS. And remember, from the state real estate exam, the buyer can sue on a defective TDS. They have two years to file a lawsuit on just a defective TDS. Okay, so regardless of whatever information is it, so there has to be an answer to the bottom of page one. Are you the seller aware of any of the above that are not in operating condition? Yes or no. If the answer is yes, please explain. Um, top of page two, uh, are you the seller aware of any significant malfunction or defects or malfunction in any of the following? Yes or no. Um, and those are both required. And if they don't put that answer in there, then we're going to have to get that answered. So uh, at some point, okay. All right. Um, so that being said, uh, I get down into here's the reason that I don't need a separate carbon monoxide uh, disclosure form. Um, because we have in the TDS already. Um, I get down to paragraph number C, and now um, this is the part that my clients have so much fun with. So C is almost never completed properly. I, I, you know, and, and again, I'm not the one making the disclosure, the seller is, uh, but uh, question, uh, how long do you keep historical inspections records? Um, I would recommend that uh, you remember that if you have a file in zip forms, um, we're going to keep it. If you don't touch it, we're going to keep it for five years and then we're going to shred it. The theory being that is that they've got to bring the lawsuit within three years, but um, we're going to let you keep it for five years just in case. OK, so um, sometimes those files can be exhibit A against you at trial. But what you want to do with your transaction is you want to export the file to uh, your, your computer, to your cloud-based system or whatever, so that you have a record of it um, and not rely on zip forms. So uh, uh, if you don't touch the transaction for 18 months and you never had a send anything out for electronic signature, then uh, we're going to shred it at the end of 18 months. We're going to shred it then, okay? So just be aware that's what we do. Um, and we do that to protect you and, and everybody else, and plus a whole bunch of paperwork that nobody has any knowledge of what it's about, okay? So um, so uh, I hope, Judy, I hope I answered your question. Um, so are you the seller aware of any of the following? And we added the word mold to this, uh, because people were just saying no, but then we added the word mold. Um, and I tell my sellers, I say, you know, do you have any mold in the house? And they say, uh, we don't know. What does that look like? And I go, I don't know. Uh, but but uh, chances are that you do. Mold is everywhere. And so my sellers will literally check yes to this box. And then down in the, uh, you know, please answer any yes answers. Please uh, be, give us more detail. You know, they talk about, you know, this the subject matter. So um, so paragraph number two, features of the property shared in common with adjoining landowners. We almost always have something that's uh, that we're sharing, the, the wall, the fence, the driveway, you know, anything that they share in common with another. And 99% of the time, if I ask somebody whose wall that is, they say, I don't know. So, you know, this again is an important feature of this uh, disclosure is to do that. And then, and then again, the seller who just checks no to everything means you didn't go over the, the, the form with them. Okay. Um, and I think it's really important that you do that. Uh, another question. Um, I get a lot of TDS that are incomplete or inaccurate. I know that you do. I get them too. Should sellers then use an addendum to complete? Um, until the buyer has signed it, it's probably okay for the seller to amend their TDS. And again, the law requires that they amend their TDS. And if they amend their TDS, the, the buyer would then have additional time to, uh, to rescind the contract. So uh, new five-day, new three-day timeline restarts. Uh, yes, if it's a material fact affecting the value or desirability of the property. And so we're looking at... Um, the distance, you know, we're looking at uh, transactions that uh, are going to have a three-day uh, three 
right of rescission. And it's going to say it at the bottom of this agreement when we see or this uh, disclosure. I'll show you that in just a second. OK, so uh, good question. Thank you, Dolly. Um, uh, I don't know of a property that doesn't have an easement on it, so I don't know how you can answer no to that. Room additions uh, without necessary permits. Okay, that's a good question. Um, but it, even though they didn't have the permits done, it could have been built better than the than the uh, you know the permit required. Um, uh, three day, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, whoops, another one coming in here. Uh, okay, got it. I'm just uh, when when you type in a question, I see it on my screen, so I'm just trying to read it. Um, okay. Um, uh, did you do anything that was not in compliance with uh, building codes? And again, this is one of the reasons why the buyer has a right to rescind because they may not want to buy that problem. Okay. So, um, uh, fill, uh, settling, uh, flooding, drainage, grading problems. Uh, uh, notice here, uh, uh, damage to the, to the property or any structures from fire, earthquake, flood. Remember, our th three of our natural hazard uh, zone disclosure requirements are two fire, two flood, two earthquake. So, uh, you know, are, were there any damages from that? Uh, any zoning violations, if any? Uh, neighborhood noise or other problems? I don't, I don't know how you can answer, you know, no to that. Um, I can tell you that... Um, you know, my house, uh, you know, the very first night uh, in my house, you know, the train went by and I thought the, the world was coming to an end. Uh, and so, you know, but over the, the dozen plus years that I've lived there, I don't even hear it anymore. So I sometimes have to remind myself I've got to disclose the trains. I've got to disclose the helicopters that fly in the front of my window. If I can read their call sign, that means they're too close, you know, things like that. So, yeah, I think all properties have noises and, and nuisances, whether they're public or private nuisances. Um, CCNRs or other deed restrictions. My house is not in a subdivision. It was built in 1952. Um, but I can tell you, I, I'm not able to build a 16 story high rise because there's a restriction on that type of uh, building in that uh, area. So pretty much all properties have a restriction. HOA, maybe yes, no. Common areas, eh, maybe yes, no. Um, Notice of abatement or citations against the property. So those are going to be um, the notice of abatement is going to say stop doing this or or clean this up. And if you don't clean this up, then we'll come out and issue a notice of a, a citation, which is a ticket. So uh, you can get a notice of abatement. It means clean it up. You'll have a period of time to do it. Usually the fire department is the, is the one that's going to be issuing that notice. And oh, by the way, when, when they, uh, if you don't clean it up, they'll come out and clean it up for you. They can put it on your tax bill and they can foreclose against it. So the state can foreclose against the property based on that. OK, um, and then finally, any lawsuits, the one thing that uh, most people don't want to talk about. Um, and again, any of the any yes answers will, will be explained down here. When I get to paragraph number D, I see that this is health and safety code talks about operable smoke detectors. Um, this is why I don't need the don't need the smoke detector statement of compliance, and then after that I have the uh, water tank heater braced, anchored, or strapped in place in, in accordance with applicable law. Again, uh, this is going to be a, a health and safety issue, um, and so. Um, uh, this is why I don't need the water heater bracing form anymore. You all will recall they were separate forms at one point. Um, then at the top of page three, the seller signs it. We did everything we could to try to get that to stay on page two, but we just couldn't do it. Um, the next paragraph, the agent's inspection disclosure, and I should probably go back to my notes to show you, but the, the TDS is considered not complete until the agent provides their, the seller's agent provides their AVID to the buyer, okay? Um, so uh, let's, uh, let's see, did I cover that in the PowerPoint uh, form ESD, which I showed you a second ago. Here's my AVID, uh, TDS not considered complete until the seller's agent provides their completed AVID to the buyer. Um, okay, so let's uh, go back. Um, I just want to show you the rest of this one here. This is one of the most important forms we're going to talk about. So the agent uh, has uh, several options. Uh, whoops, why did that happen? Okay, the agent has uh, several options. Um, they can they can say, see the attached AVID. I'm finding that probably 99% of the brokers that I speak with are requiring their agents to do an AVID. 
um, because frankly, there's not enough room here to put down all the stuff you probably noticed about the property. And the other thing to consider is, is that the Avid is actually walks you through the property. And we're going to talk about that uh, form in a minute. All right. But it actually walks you through the property. Um, and, and as uh, Veronica has said, um, you know, you, you just need to be able to defend the fact that you actually went to the property. And so page one, pre-printed language, page two, uh, all about the uh, interior, page three, all about the exterior. OK. All right. Um, the second option, agent notes, no item for disclosure. I cannot imagine that uh, being an effective uh, checkbox. Uh, Pete Selecki said once in a class, he says, if you come up with no items for disclosure, I will go with you to the property and we're going to come up with a lot of stuff. And his his TDS, as he says, is six pages long. And so, you know, Pete's a great attorney and I respect his opinion. And so, you know, my uh, avid is fairly complicated. So, uh, or they can write their notes in here. Um, and again, remember, it's not the t the uh, TDS requirement is not complete until the the buyer gets the seller's agent's avid. Okay. All right. Uh, question. Uh, and how about disclosing in progress neighborhood disputes? Could very well be absolutely right. Is it a material fact? And the chances are, yeah, it is. If they're fighting over the fence on the property line, it is a material fact because it can affect your future ownership interest in the property. Okay, good good question, Judy. All right, so um, the, the second section down here is the agent's, uh, the buyer's agent's AVID. Um, the most common mistake that I see is that the uh, software was having the um, agent sign the um, I'm sorry, the seller and the seller's agent signed down here before the buyer completed this part up here. I think they might have fixed that now. But um, remember, you never sign below a blank. Um, and whenever signatures are stacked, you sign in chronological order. So you, the uh, seller would sign here first. The seller's agent would sign here second. The uh, buy, I'm sorry, the uh, the buyer's agent would sign here third, and then down here is signing complete. And then down here at the bottom, everybody would acknowledge receipt. Well, you can't acknowledge a receipt of a blank. So if this part's not filled out yet, the seller shouldn't be signing that. Uh, or buyer, uh, none of the parties should be signing that. Then down at the problem uh, at the bottom of page three, as I promised you earlier, Civil Code 1102.3, the buyer has a right to rescind a purchase for at least three days, right, after delivery of the disclosure, if it occurs after... <laughs> after the signing of an offer to purchase. So again, um, if you give it to them after they have committed to the contract, they've got a three-day right to rescind. If you give it to them prior to the contract, then they have no right to rescind. Everybody okay with that? Uh, question. Um, how do you feel about including pictures in the TDS? Not in the TD, well, the TDS perhaps. Um, but clearly in the AVID, and we'll talk about that in a minute, there's a, a feature in the AVID that if you are doing your AVID on a tablet or a cell phone, um, you have the ability to attach pictures to it as you as you go along. Um, it should Remember, this, the TDS belongs to the seller. So should the seller be providing pictures? And, and, and clearly, and I had this conversation a couple hours ago, um, you know, should the seller be disclosing repair? And I always say, hey, of all things, you fixed it disclose it, right? Um, you know, self-help, okay. A little different than paying a contractor to do it. Just remember, if the seller fixes something, there's no privy of contract between the buyer and that contractor. The, the privy of contract is only with the seller. So you might be inviting the seller back to the property after closing, okay? So great question, Judy. Thank you. Um, okay, is everybody good with the TDS then? Uh, let me go... Uh, what was our next one? So that was the, oh, oh the Avid. Um, oh, we're on the Avid. Okay, did I lose my mind? Probably temporarily. Okay, so let's grab, uh, uh, why am I not even remembering looking at the Avid? So let's take a look at the Avid. Here we go, very first form. So I know we haven't done that one yet. So here's my Avid. And the Avid is really simple. So one, one form fits all. One same form for the seller's agent as for the buyer's agent. The top part is usually filled in because you filled in other parts of the of the uh, forms in the transaction. Um, the 
Um, if it is a, if it is, so remember, civil code protects the innocent buyer and seller, and that's through the civil code. So uh, residential one to four, the law feels that once you're doing fives and greater, you probably don't need protection. That's going to be uniform commercial code. Um, it's going to be a different issue. But for uh, purposes of residential one to four transactions, um, if you're going to do a, a, a duplex, a triplex, or a fourplex, then you would still use this form, but you would use a separate one for each of those. So this AVID form is for unit number one, number two, number three, number four, okay? All right, um, so you'll find that it doesn't fill in the broker's firm's name because they don't know right offhand whether this is the buyer's agent or the seller's agent. But notice all this really cool language down here. California law does not require the agent to inspect the following, okay, areas that are not reasonably uh, and normally accessible. I've had attorneys ask me whether or not, you know, they should have opened up doors and things like that. I, I believe that they should open up the doors, but I, I don't believe that they need to open up locked cabinets. I mean, that's a separate issue. Now, if the seller unlocks it or the agent unlocks it, then there you go, you're in. Right. OK, so uh, certainly not public records or permits. I tell you all the time, do not be pulling permits for people. Let them do that themselves or they could pay a company to do that. And then it goes through all the other various items that are uh, disclosure items for the agent. What this means to you, I like this paragraph. I, I had a lawsuit a couple of years ago now where the uh, plaintiff's attorney, I'm sorry, the uh, defendant, the broker's attorney, um, have this blown up on the board in front of the jury and essentially it said that the uh, um, the, the, the buyer's uh, complaint was that they felt that the agent's inspection and the seller's disclosures were sufficient that they didn't have to run their own investigation of the property. And this form very clearly says, says the opposite of that. And so the attorney put that up there, you know, is this your initial? Yes. Uh, you know, well, uh, you know, how come it says it here? And the agents had never said anything to contradict this. And this is one of the reasons I tell you why it is so important for you to read the forms. You should at least read them once so that you, you have an idea of what they say and you want to make sure that you don't make conflicting statements. So if the form says one thing, you don't want to say something else, right? So uh, you don't want to say, for example, that, uh, you know, that, wow, that's amazingly good construction. Yeah, I don't care if you're a contractor or not. You've got your real estate hat on. And remember what Wayne Bell says about, you know, the education and experience, you know, from, uh, you know, that you obtain to get your license and nothing more than that. Okay. So, uh, um, down here at the bottom in bold print, buyers should review any disclosures obtained from the seller, uh, obtain advice about, you know, the information from the appropriate professional. If it was, uh, if the buyer has a question about the physical inspection, they need to call the physical inspector. Okay. Uh, and then finally, um, review any findings of those professionals with the person who prepared them. Um, and if you don't do that, then you are definitely acting against the advice of the broker. So, uh, you know, you have your have your client initial about that. So that's page one of the AVID. Page two is all about the interior of the property. And so, as I can see up here, we want to we want to be able to prove that. And I talked about this this morning, um, but uh, you want to be able to prove that you actually did your inspection. That's what Veronica says. So, you know, if you put in here you know, clears the bell, 74 degrees, sunshine, and then the attorney goes and looks up that date, and, and it was rain, uh, three inches of rain over three different days, and, and uh, you know, obviously, you did not uh, do this at or about the time that you um, were supposed to have done your inspection of the property, so, so again, those are going to be very important, and then once again, we see the same language, oh, I'm sorry, before I get to that, um, date, time, weather conditions, other persons present, very important. They may be good uh, defense witnesses uh, if you need them, okay? Um, so based on a reasonably competent, diligent visual inspection of the reasonably and normally accessible areas of the property, bingo. So now I'm going to put those down there. So what do I put in? So I go in the entryway and I look around and I don't see anything that kind of stands out, jumps out at me. So I put nothing noted, right? I go to the living room and I see a crack on the on the wall. And so uh, I put minor settling crack on wall. And I'm going to say, you know, red flags need to be going off because your job is to disclose 
not diagnose. And so when you start opining about what the cause of the crack is or the extent of it or the remedy to fix it, you know, uh, you know, just needs a little epoxy. And it's like, you know, I wouldn't be making those statements. Right. So, you know, again, you know, I've got a, uh, you know, I've got enough experience in this that I would not be representing something more than my license has trained me to do. And so I had a really ugly case about, you know, an agent just made a comment to a buyer, you know, they were on a, a, a Bayfront property and they made the comment that the uh, the stem wall looks okay to me, that literally it was low tide, they could actually see part of it, but what they were looking at was not the stem wall. And so they made a comment that the stem wall looks okay to me. Well, needless to say, the stem wall was being eaten alive by uh, eels. Um, there's a, a, a special eel. Um, and so, you know, the agent should not have made that comment. So you need to act within your lane, right? Stay within your lane, only give them information based on uh, what your license allows you to do, okay? So again, so that's this language, the undersigned, blah, 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 right? Uh, a visual inspection of the reasonably and normally accessible areas of the property. So, you know, you need to, uh, you know, it's in bold print. Okay. So, uh, so finally going down through all this, I get down to the bottom, everybody initials it, I get into my um, page three, which is all about the exterior of the property, make your notations, you know. Uh, so for example, I frequently see, uh, you know, minor settling cracks on the driveway. Well, that's going to get everybody upset, right? Because they normally think, and again, the driveway is a different pour, and usually the gra the garage floor is a different pour than the rest of the house. So there tend to be cracks in it, but I would not be diagnosing it. I would put crack noted in driveway. I would not put minor settling crack noted in driveway. I would, I would, uh, you know, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be, uh, extending myself on that. And again, mind you, you gain nothing from doing it in the first place. Uh, Dolly, others certainly have been never to include inspector as person present during the inspection. Um, let me qualify that. So the question is a really good one. So um, Dolly is saying other instructors have advised me never to include inspector as a person present during the inspection. I would I would say you want to put down who was there. You do not want to rely on their report. So yes, they were present. Yes, I think you need to put that down there. And again, I don't know who it is that's, that's saying that. And I'm okay. I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm saying I would put them in there. Um, but as I have, I have said, always have said this, the inspector goes right, you go left. Do not do not be near the inspector. Their inspection has nothing to do with, with yours. Yeah, theirs is an investigation. Um, I've seen agents write in their avid, you know, see a physical inspection report dated such and such, you know, making it sound like it's official. I would never do that, right? You Their, their investigation is different than your inspection. So um, yes, there were a person present. Um, you you needed to, to corroborate the fact of who was there, but I would never include their report in your report. Uh, and, and I wouldn't be, you know, I have... I have been through thousands of these inspections, and and I'll never forget John Hasty. God rest his soul. He was with Countywide, um, uh, and I did an inspection with him. He did the inspection. Um, uh, actually, twenty nine nineteen Kate Sebastian Place in Cardiff, and this was uh, 40, 30, 35 years ago. And and uh, you know he goes through his whole play. He was up in the attic, and he comes down. He's covered with all the batting from the attic and all that stuff. And so he's down. He's sitting on the on the kitchen floor, and I'm looking up above him, and the ceiling light is hanging from a wire. And so I turned to him and I said, uh, John, did you want to note that ceiling light uh, hanging from the wire? And he goes, Oh God, leave. It, leave it to a, a physical inspector. By the way, he was a master inspector. So he's got huge credentials um, and he missed it. And so sometimes that happens, but I clearly was not relying on his report for mine. My obligation is much, much lower than his is, right? And my obligation is much lower than the seller's. I have the least amount of obligation um, uh, in the transaction. I just have to do a reasonably competent, diligent visual inspection of the accessible areas of the property. And so, you know, but the seller's disclosure requirements, you know, newer should have known, the, the buyer's investigation requirements, they all have a higher standard than, than I actually have. So, uh, but I need to do my job. 
job. And so, uh, so, so Dolly, great question. Um, um, yeah, I would still put them on there because they were physically present. You know, what are you trying to hide? I mean, I don't understand the, you know, and again, I'm, uh, it may be getting lost, uh, you know, on me, but, but uh, I put them down there. I just would never rely on their inspection to be my inspection ever. That's not going to happen. Not in California anyway. So, uh, um, Okay, I hope I answered the question. Um, this is the tricky part. This is what gets us in trouble with the Department of Real Estate. So this, here we are again, reasonably competent, diligent visual inspection. I mean, how many times do you have to hear that, right? When I talk to a real estate attorney, they they they, they quote this like, you know, oatmeal. It's just, you know, they're just going to have that down. Um, and notice it says the real estate broker, uh, uh, the firm that it should say that, but it says who performed the inspection. Um, but then underneath that, it says the signature of the associate licensee or broker who performed the inspection. So this is what the Department of Real Estate is looking at right now. Um, the Department of Real Estate says um, agents are going out and doing their AVID, but then bringing it back to the office and, and the team lead is signing it. And so the DRE's position on that is we think that's fraud. And I'm like, that's a big word, right? That's a big four letter word fraud. Okay. It's actually five letters, right? Um, but, but that's a big deal. Um, when the Department of Real Estate says that, you know, understand that if you did the inspection, you need to sign it, right? And so I know we get into the you know, chest beating and the saber rattling and all that stuff, you know, because we're really cool team leaders and things like that. But I, the, the Department of Real Estate is looking at that and taking it for its, for its uh, face. And so I, I would probably, so uh, Joe uh, Kazora, one of our brokers, uh, one of Linda's brokers, I don't have any brokers, but one of Linda's brokers, accompanied me on a listing appointment up in Lake or Lake Forest, Lake Forest in LA about a year or two ago now. Um, and I sat down with a seller for three and a half hours and had them sign and, and complete every disclosure uh, in, for, that was going to be used in the real estate transaction. This is a good example of how I endear myself to the seller. I never have the commission questions are always the very last question. But but they know for a fact that by the time that they've been sitting with me for three and a half hours, they never try to negotiate commissions with me, right? It's like, no, I, I mean, I'll go up, but, you know, we've done all this work. But that's why the listing agreement is always the last thing I have to sign. So anyway, with that being in mind, Joe, who is a broker, got his ticket 71, right? So um, I told him, I said, I don't think people were alive back then. Um, but but anyway, he went around the property and did the Abbott. It was my listing. I don't usually take listings, but it was my listing, a uh, uh, former student. Um, and uh, But Joe did the Abbott. And so Joe signed the Abbott. Joe's name is on the Abbott. And then, so Joe's broker's license is under Linda. My broker's license is under Linda. So we we satisfied the statutory requirement, but I was clearly not going to sign a document that I didn't do. Is everybody okay with that? I, I want to make sure we're really clear about that, all right? Um, oh my gosh, I'm looking at the time. Okay, so uh, and then there are the anonymous, welcome back. And then there are those agents who never access the property. The super box has never been activated by the agent, but they fill out their buyer's agent's avid and copy word for word what the listing agent avid says. Oh, listen, <laughs> again, did you do your own avid? And the answer is no. Um, I had that happen, uh, a transaction that was a uh, short sale down in uh, Spring Valley. And the uh, the, the uh, buyer who was a flipper and, and and not to say anything bad about that, but but uh, you know they put in an offer, we countered, we wanted a higher price, etc. Um, got the offer put together, and then uh, two weeks later they came back with a request for repair and asked us to lower the price another twenty thousand dollars. And I said, uh, upon what do you base that uh, that reduction in price? And they said, well, because, you know, we we had an inspection done of the property and we and uh, we found that it, it needed more work than we thought it did. And so uh, I looked up the central lock box, right, which is the the standard uh, for uh, box for San Diego. And they had never accessed the property. And, and no, in fact, nobody had during the two week period of time that we were pending. And so it was literally a shakedown. So I turned that file over to the Department of Real Estate. And I just let them go after them. I haven't heard about the agent ever since but um you know it's just one of those cases where you know you you lied uh you know it's worse you know you you look for a price reduction and you never did go to the property so um so thank you for that uh anonymous so uh judy and then there are those who uh never access property the, the super wow you said 
Somehow you said exactly the same thing that Anonymous said. Are you Anonymous? Um, it is exactly word for word what they said. So you are, I don't know how you did that. I think it's the program. I apologize. But uh, um, but thank, thank you to both of you who had uh, amazing insight into that. So notice in here, you know, that... Uh, um, the buyer should obtain advice about an inspection of the property from other appropriate professionals. And if the buyer fails to do so, buyer is acting against the advice of broker. <laughs> and there is such a form, by the way, up here in my all forms. There's a, a form up there that's uh, created by uh, CAR sample letters. So when I'm up here, I go down, uh, uh, sorry, I go down here to sample letters, and then you'll see that here's acting against the broker's advice for the buyer, acting against the broker's advice for the seller. So, you know, we've accounted for that um, yeah, because people will do what they're going to do. Um, buyer signs it, seller initials, just evidence that they've seen it. Um, the, and then the agent representing the seller signs it. And then the agent representing the buyer signs it again when the, when the signatures are stacked. We sign them in chronological order when they are um, next to each other. It doesn't matter who signs first. Okay, so that's my AVID. Are there any questions about the AVID? I think the AVID's a really cool form. It, 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 the truth will set you free. Uh, I, I think that uh, um, most people underestimate the, the value that it places in protecting yourself, your client, and your broker. Uh, and so, uh, again, be really good about how you fill out that AVID. And again, if you want a copy, I spent a lot more time because I only had four forms to talk about earlier today. Send me an email and I will send you uh, the, uh, um, the, the video from today. Um, appraisal discrimination addendum, we have that now at the bottom of the purchase agreement. And again, now I'm getting into areas that I'm not going to pull up the individual forms. Um, final inspection report, that's going to be for my uh, defensible space. Um, and that's, again, Civil Code 1102.6 applies to property located in a very high fire hazard severity. Usually you're going to get that, that natural hazard disclosure uh, report um, that will um, uh, uh, let, let the seller know whether or not they're in such a zone. Uh, I have one right now where the seller says, I don't want to pay for that. It's not in a zone. I looked it up. And I, so my response was, you looked up all six zones. Um, and then, of course, then later on, we're selling the house for you know $3 million and the seller's trying to save 95 bucks. And it's like, you know what? Um, I am not going to jail with you. <laughs> so anyway, um, fire defensible space compliance. Again, this is 1102.19. By the way, 1102.19 has the same statutory rescission rights because it's in Civil Code 1102. Okay, remember 1102.3 was the TDS. 1102.19 is the uh, 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 home fire hardening and defensible space. Um, so this, again, applies to property in high or very high fire hazard severity. Um, fire home hardening, again, 1102.6, applies to property located uh, there. Carbon monoxide disclosure, that's 1102.6 also. Again, 1102 is the seller's duty to disclose, right? It's included on page two of the current TDS. We already talked about that. Um, smoke detector statement of compliance, health and safety code. I mean, if you're one of those people that just likes to, I mean, I looked all these things up. So um, I spent a lot of time. I spent uh, really, I, you know, I spent a day on it. Um, so, um, you know, and it's also uh, California Code of Regulations, also included on page two of the current TDS. You don't need the separate form. I'm constantly having TC send me forms I don't need. Um, water heater bracing also in the TDS, uh, page two of the TDS. Water conserving fixtures compliance, again, that's 1101. It is not a point of sale requirement. It's something you should do anyway. Um, and it applies only to real property built on or before uh, January of 1994. Uh, so if it's a newer property, you don't necessarily need it. And some of you may know the city of San Diego has now um, uh, eliminated the water conservation certificate. Um, and, and their statement was, we think we've pretty much gotten everybody. So uh, they think they are, they're done with that, that uh, issue. Um, window security bars are also included in Civil Code 1102. Um, and in the TDS for real property, it's included. It's also included in the manufactured home transfer disclosure statement. Um, and so no need to provide a separate form. 
homeowner's guide to earthquake safety, one of those environmental hazards forms you need to send over. Um, again, it's a booklet, it's a form. It also includes the lead paint uh, disclosure. Um, there is no natural hazard disclosure statement form anymore. And I just thought that was, I mean, for me, I remember talking to Gov about Gov Hutchinson about it, and we were laughing because, you know, he says, you know, it's civil code 1103.7. Um, but CAR says the form wasn't being used, so they stopped uh, providing it. So it's literally not even in the library anymore. So why? Because people were, were going to those third-party uh, vendors, um, natural hazard disclosure companies. Um, so there is no uh, form anymore. Um, you need to double check that the NHD company that you're using, and, and I'm not going to state who we use, but we only use one company, um, uh, make sure that the NHD company that you're using is providing the forms that we're about to talk about, because the one that we use has all of those. Um, we don't worry about it, but again, I'll, I'll handle that offline, but uh, not all the companies do that. Um, so uh, mining operations, there's no form, um, but it is included in the National Hazard Report. Seismic hazard zones uh, uh, are also in civil code, special flood hazard areas, state responsibility areas, very high fire hazard severity zones, um, uh, airport in the vicinity. There is no form um, for that. It is civil code, uh, no area of potential flooding. Uh, and there's my civil code references, uh, uh, government code. So actually, I'm sorry, these, these two should be up on the next line. Um, and then the civil code will be separate. Uh, should be a space there. And what was I thinking? Um, okay, there is a CAR form for tenants. Uh, it's called the tenant flood hazard zone, uh, tenant flood hazard form. Um, and believe it or not, in San Diego County, um, you can go to the San Diego, the seller can go, the owner can go to the San Diego uh, website. Let me see if I have that form in here. I just wanted to show you what it looked like. Um, there's my manufactured home disclosure statement. Uh, here, I promised you I wasn't going to go through. Here we go. Tenant flood hazard. So here's the tenant flood hazard. So there is one for tenants. CAR has created one for tenants. So whenever we do a tenancy, we know we have to provide the form. We are always going to check the box that it's located in a special flood hazard zone, whether it is or not. And I'm saying this on tape. But the reason I do that is because, you know, listen, they can't sue me for telling telling them that it was in the flood hazard zone when it isn't. But they can certainly sue me if I tell them it isn't, and it was. So I really think that uh, that the default language here should say it's in the zone, um, uh, or check this box that says it's not in the zone. Again, a seller's disclosure. Um, you can go to the website and look up whether the property's in it or not. But this, uh, San Diego, if you go to the county website, you can actually pull up the physical property. You type in the address of the property, and it'll tell you whether or not the property's in the zone. So we provide that to the tenant um, along with the form, um, uh, you know, for, for disclosure reasons, obviously. So I wanted to show you that we had that. Um, uh, there's no earthquake fault zone form anymore. Again, the NHD form has been eliminated. Uh, we just rely on the third party vendor. Farm or ranch proximity, um, the inspection notice, uh, there's no form for that. Um, there is a, a HUD form, the HID, which is the uh, a notice to the buyer that they should have an inspection done on the property uh, under both of those circumstances under uh, FHA, NVA. Common interest development documents, uh, it's usually something you're going to get from the title company. It is covered by civil code. And you know from paragraph number three of the RPA that the civil code 4525 uh, has rescission rights associated with it. So very important uh, advisability of title insurance. And again, I'll send you the, the, the quotation of all these things. Uh, 1057, right? Um, pest control inspection report and certification. So I want to make it very clear that there is no requirement at law in California to have a pest inspection done of a property. We covered in the RPA on paragraph number uh, 12B1C. Um, it, there, is, there is a civil code that says, civil code 1099 says that the seller's agent, seller and seller's agent must deliver the inspection report and subsequent certification of work completed to the buyer only if required by contract or the buyer's lender. 
Um, so I have I have done it before where since I know it's not required by law unless I have one, then I have to tell them. Um, I'll literally tell the buyer they can't use that lender if the lender is going to require it. It's called a lender overlay. And an overlay means that it's a specific requirement of that particular lender so that when they go to sell the loan, they think they have better bargaining position on their, on their package. But if there's no law that requires the seller to do any repairs, um, and again, uh, paragraph uh, 12B1C says um, that the buyer has the right to investigate the property, and that includes having an inspection for wood-destroying pests and organisms. And so let the buyer do the investigation, let the buyer submit the request for repairs asking for it. But, you know, we specifically went to the lenders and said, how come you keep requiring a clearance? And the lenders had responded with the fact that, well, you keep putting it in the contract. So some of you have been around a while. You'll remember paragraph 4A. 4A was the paragraph that had the WPA attached to it, the wood destroying pest addendum attached to it. I made a lot of money off of that. I mean, there are a lot of people who thought that, that a pest inspection was required by law. And even the lenders don't require it. I mean, the you know, most of the lenders that we work with don't require it. And people think of the VA requires it. The VA does not uh, require, the VA changes their position on it frequently. But I read the VA lenders handbook before I did a big presentation for a big lender. Um, and they were all shocked. They thought for sure that it was required. I showed them the quotation in the book. The, the VA says that there are areas in the United States that are known to have a higher instance of, of, uh, of critters. But, um, you know, there's no requirement to do it unless the the appraiser, um, by the way, who is not a, a licensed to say, you know, this is a termite or this is a, you know, the fungus among us or this is the, you know, dry rot or whatever. Um, and yet if they call it out in the report in their uh, appraisal, then uh, the, there's going to be uh, then they can require the report that way. But it's, you, you know, it's specific for individual properties. And so, um, again, if it's a VA transaction, the buyer may not be required to pay for the report. So the seller gets on the hook for the report. However, the, the veteran uh, borrower can be made to do the work. So sometimes it's a, it's a, a you know, an oopsies, uh, it backfires on the agent that requires the, uh, and we have an offer right now on a property where the, the uh, buyer's agent is requiring section one termite clearance. We're deleting it from the contract. You know, we're, we're not going to do it. So uh, the seller's deleting it from the contract. Judy, is it true that the NHD industry is unregulated? Um, that is true. Uh, <laughs> there, there's a regulation that that they want to comply with, but it doesn't. Their industry is not regulated, much like the physical inspection industry is not regulated. Um, the CAR realized that there was no regulation. They really didn't want the state of California to get involved in it because you know they do such a great job with everything else. So uh, CAR ended up creating a a, a licensing uh, you know class and certification class and stuff like that, um, and. Uh, I haven't taken it. They're probably pretty good. I mean, I don't know. But uh, um, yeah, so uh, is it true that because of the non-regulation, they are not required to carry air E and O insurance to protect them, your client or agent. I would say that's probably a safe bet. But first, good lawsuit, and you're probably out of business. So that's why I'm I'm really particular about who we use. The company that we use that we ask the seller to to provide and the buyer to use is uh, twenty million dollars worth of E and O insurance. You know all that stuff um, because a company that doesn't have insurance. Uh, remember that the courts have held that if there's a mistake that's made. And I've had these happen where the uh, the uh, natural hazard company identified that the property was not in a zone when in fact it was in a zone. Um, and so the courts have held that the, really the only remedy is to uh, essentially have the seller, you know, it's the price of the property. Maybe the seller buys the property back. I don't know. But um, it's the price of the property because you can't move the property out of the zone. So, uh, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a tricky wicket. It's a difficult one. So, uh, um, but, uh, you know, again, one good lawsuit, you're out of business anyway. So uh, this is why I tell you never to uh, make the requirement that the buyer accept a certain natural hazard disclosure company. I see people doing it all the time. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, 
again, the buyer can pay for it, seller can pay for it, whatever. But the agent that recommends one company it could be held uh, for negligent referral when they make their mistake. And I have seen that happen. So thank you, Judy, for that. Uh, so uh, private transfer fee, there's no form. It is included, by the way, in the uh, SBSA. Uh, we do have an MCN form uh, for purposes of uh, notifying the purchaser whether or not there was a, a, a release or whether a, a contamination notice was filed against a property that is normally filed at the county recorder's office, uh, flood disaster insurance requirements, um, ground basin uh, comprehensive uh, notices, if received, if you have one, um, supplemental property tax notice, again, under under 1102.6, you know, that, that's the famous story of, uh, you know, the buyer calling you 30 days after closing and saying, I thought you told me the seller paid all the taxes, and how come I'm getting a tax bill when that tax bill is usually the supplemental tax bill, so we have explained it in the SBSA, they did a pretty good job of writing it out and explaining uh, what that looks like, so you do not need a separate form if you've had the buyer sign the SBSA. The SBSA SA really covers a lot of evil. It really takes care of a lot of things. Um, so I, I don't know why you wouldn't do it in a, in a transaction. I know that I asked Neil when we first, Neil Kalen when we first came out with a form, and Neil promised me that he that they were going to check the box in the contract so that it automatically applied to the transaction. And then I think they may have chosen not to do that because it's like thirteen pages long, uh, and uh, and uh, it would just uh, make the purchase agreement overly burdensome. But but uh, I think it should be included in every transaction. I really do. It's a great form. And, and it was our first experiment, by the way, with the grid pattern. So that's what it looks like. If you've seen the uh, uh, SBSA, um, you know, I'll pull that one up really fast just because I think it's interesting. Uh, how am I doing? Oh, my gosh. Uh, for, for those of the, you that know me know I could keep going on all night because uh, I just the disclosures are kind of my bailiwick. I really have fun with disclosures. Um, here it is, Statewide Buyer and Seller Advisory. I'm only showing you this because it was pretty well done. Um, but this was our beginning. This was the grid pattern before um, we did the purchase agreement. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's a, an awesome form. Um, I know that you don't want to state who you use, but I like to use a company. Okay, good. Yes, I agree. Uh, Judy, I agree with you. I'm only agreeing with you because nobody can see who you put in there. Uh, and yes, that's the company that we use. <laughs> so anyway, I have to be apolitical about things, right? Okay. All right. And I've been pretty good about that all these decades. Uh, so that's my uh, supplemental property tax notice. Again, please don't send me the form. I don't need it. It's in the SBSA. Um, but there is a separate form. If you're not going to use the SBSA, again, I don't know why you wouldn't. Uh, gas and hazardous liquid transmission pipeline also included in the SBSA. Notice the civil code requirement to make the disclosure is on you. It's 2079. That is your requirement to make the disclosure. Um, so we, we accomplished that in the SBSA form again. Meth lab cleanup orders, health and safety code. Um, here it is again, um, re release of illegal controlled substance remediation or death on the property in the last three years, again, covered in my exempt seller disclosure, but also covered in my seller property questionnaire. So if I pull up my seller property questionnaire, then I'm going to see, uh, it might actually, Steve's going to laugh, it might actually be time for me to get classes. Um although my doctor says I've got great vision. So maybe it's just me. Uh, so here's my seller property questionnaire. And uh, uh, here are all my statutory or contractually required or uh, related disclosures. It gives me a whole list of all these things, including methamphetamine contamination and, and stuff like that. Actually, I, I, oh, death on the property. I'm sorry. That's what I was trying to to find so death on the property very first thing within the last three years the death of an occupant of the property upon the property not bedroom number two not you know in the kitchen it anywhere on the four corners so i grabbed the four corners of the property a uh, death on the property okay so heaven's gate rancho santa fe 40 people they were all over the property right it doesn't matter well it doesn't matter i mean i feel bad for 40 people who off themselves that was an interesting way to go but um uh death on the property. And so the, the buyer of that property, it was priced at 2.3 million, I think. We showed it two weeks before the, the, 
the event, the heinous act is what it's called. Um, and the city of San Diego changed the name of the street. The property sold ultimately to a buyer for 750 grand who made a movie out of it um, and then uh, leveled, the, leveled the home and built a new home on there. So my question to you is, do you still have to disclose the death on the property? And the answer is absolutely on the property. Again, not not dependent on the you know how many uh, you know uh, you know where the death actually occurred. Okay, so um, uh, now and I'm going to tell you that you know fast forward now, 15 years later, um, it's a heinous act. I mean, it's like the Sharon Tate murders. I think those carry with the land. I think you're still going to have to <laughs> make those disclosures. But I sure don't want to be the agent that handles the transaction, only to have the buyer come back and say, "Hey, how come you didn't tell me about that?" Um, something else that got called out in this morning's class, and this is the term ordinance. So notice ordinance doesn't have an I in it. Ordinance is a rule or a county regulation or, or something like that. But ordinance is stuff that goes boom. Okay, so... Um, and we have the, you know, Coronado, you know, it was a, it was an artillery range. It's where we shot things from the ships, you know, and into, cause we like to see the sand puff up, right. Um, Terra Santa was an old army base. And so, you know, we, we have areas in, in San Diego County that are, that are, you know, you might be selling a property that's within a mile of a former federal or state ordinance location. And so, you know, that's what these natural hazard, uh, you know, hopefully these disclosure companies are, are hitting the numbers on those too. Okay. So that's my, this is, my uh, uh, SPQ that has this, and again, same language as in the ESD, right? This is these are all my statutory disclosures. Okay, um, so we're going to bring those out. All right, uh, death on the property is uh, Civil Code seventeen ten. You know, one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, by the way, you you uh, must disclose the cause of death if asked, unless they died of uh, AIDS or HIV. Um, in which case the answer is I don't have to tell you, in which case you've just told them what how the death occurred. Um, yeah, because it could be a material, uh, it's a material fact, cause of death, but the law says not AIDS or HIV. Um, so again, Civil Code 1710 for your reading pleasure. Megan's Law Disclosure, again, also 2079. Uh, that's the registered sex offender database. It's surprising how many people are on it. Um, duty only to disclose the existence of the database. Folks, you do, it is included in the RPA. You have satisfied the statutory requirement. Criminal penalties, if you are on the database and you go to the database, I don't know, look, see what you look like on your picture, if it's current or not, I don't know, but it's against the against the law. It's a thousand dollar penalty. It's not a huge amount, but uh, you know, if you're on the database, don't go to the database, okay? Um, so duty only disclose the existence. If you go to the database, you will be held to have constructive knowledge of everybody on the database uh, at that point in time. And so here we are in deposition. The attorney says, uh, how come you didn't disclose the, the uh, registered sex offender living next door? Um, and the agent responds with, well, I didn't know. And they said, well, have you ever gone to the database? And you say, yes. When did you go? Uh, I went, you know, three months ago. Um, okay, well, they were on the database three months ago. Why didn't you disclose the fact that they were on the database? And this is like, ah, and you want them to spin you around in deposition? I'm going to recommend to you that that uh, you need to, you know, I personally like spinning the lawyers around in deposition. I like lawyers. I don't have a problem with them, right? But, uh, you know, listen, folks, uh, don't go to the database. Okay, that's just my advice. No big deal. All right, notice of a special tax and or assessment, you know, your Melarus, um, tons of civil codes on that. Um, uh, let's see, uh, if the seller has actual knowledge of industrial use and military ordinance locate ordinance no i remember that uh, california here's here's the civil code code of civil procedure um so those are my big statutory disclosure requirements all right um but then let's talk a little bit about my contractual disclosures uh, to to wrap things up uh, the contractual disclosures um, certainly, I, I know I have enough power in my statutory disclosures that, you know, things can get really interesting. But my contractual disclosures, you know, what are those? Those have cancellation rights. So, again, as I said earlier, those are things we can fight about, right? Statutory disclosures can't fight about. It. You didn't make the disclosure, buyer rescinds, you're just stuck with it. I mean, it's going to have to be, you know, uh, you know, it's a statutory right, right? But my contractual disclosures... 
those are cancellation rights, like uh, a lot of repairs need to be done or something like that. You could, you might be able to get out of the transaction without penalty, but it's not as sure a thing as the rescission rights are. Okay, so remember, statutory disclosures include rescission rights. Contractual disclosures include cancellation rights. Okay, so know your business. I always tell people this: this RA form is a showstopper. It is my best close. Okay, and so uh, did I even include it in here? Let me see. It's not a disclosure, but I do want to show you. I do this in every real estate transaction that I do. I do the uh, RA form, which is the uh, realtor acknowledgement form. It explains the difference between uh, a real estate licensee and uh, and and just a a and someone who is a, a member of the uh, National Association of Realtors and subscribes to the written code of ethics. So I use this every time I have a buyer consultation, every time I have a seller listing appointment, and I, I give them all this good language. You should be using this. This is the very first form that you ever signed in the transaction. Um, and again, I you know I always leave them with the doubt, you know, and that is uh, you know they say, well, I thought you were all alike, and the answer. Answer is no, we have 435,000 licensees in the state of California, but only 200,000 of them are actually real tours. And so this explains the difference. So now they're scratching their head going, well, who are the other three people that just came in here? You know, it's like then now they're starting to doubt, you know, but they know you're a realtor and you subscribe to a written code of ethics. I didn't say the other people weren't ethical. I just told them that I subscribe to a written code of ethics. And now they're scratching their head wondering what, well, who are those other people? Are they not? And I said, I can't. Can't really opine, uh, I can't give an opinion on that. But invariably, I'll go on a listing appointment and I'll see other people's business cards on the on the thing. So I kind of know who it was that they were interviewing. Um, and, and I'm never going to make a disparaging remark about another realtor, clearly not, or or even a licensee. But but uh, I, I certainly am going to create some doubt. And so I'm going to use that form, all right? First form, you should sign in front of them and give them a copy. And then, of course, you know, we've talked about the seller property questionnaire already. Um, it is included in the contract. It's not a statutory form. Seller's uh, FERPTA form, we call it, the Foreign Investment and Real Property Tax Act. Um, uh, or the qualified substitute uh, form um, to satisfy the uh, 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 national requirements. Um, uh, escrow, uh, escrow will handle that. Um, and here's the revenue and tax codes. Uh, SDR has some really good forms, the SPQA, the Seller Property Questionnaire Addendum. Um, again, unpeeling that onion, you know, you started with the TDS, TDS wholly deficient, you know, uh, so we have the SPQ to explain a lot of things in the TDS. And then the SPQA is the standard of practice in San Diego County that unpeels what the SPQ missed. So you have the TDS, the SPQ, the SPQA, you've got the triad, and you've got your AVID. You need to have those four forms in every transaction in San Diego County. Uh, denim to the purchase agreement. Uh, do your warnings, cyber crimes advisory, wire fraud advisory, local area disclosure, statewide buyer and seller advisory, market conditions advisory, water conserving plumbing fixtures, environmental hazards disclosure, parking and storage disclosure, right? These are not contract items. These are just uh, advisories and disclosures, statewide buyer and seller. So so anyway, are there any questions about anything we covered? Did I get done in time? Um, what time is it? Uh, there, are, oh gosh, I'm a little bit early. Okay, anybody have any questions about any of this? We, we covered a lot of material. Um, I, I can't believe I usually go way over. So I tried to speed it up a little bit and I apologize to you for that. But does anybody have any questions about anything that we've talked about? Um, uh, just for your information, I have discovered how to create a short link, a, a bit.ly link. Um, so if you go to YouTube, um, all my videos, I'm loading all my videos up onto YouTube, make it easy for everybody to find them. Um, uh, just go to, um, uh, you know, youtube.com uh, forward slash at Burke Real Estate Consultants, Inc. 
and that will take you to all my videos. I'll start including those in my PowerPoint. I've also learned how to create a QR code. So you're talking to the guy that doesn't text message people, um, but I figured out how to create a QR code. So go figure, right? So uh, anyway, if there aren't any other questions, uh, I do want to thank you for joining me today. You know, two to four, that's two hours of all this happiness. Um, again, I'm here to help you in any way that I can, um, you know, short of giving you legal advice, of course. Uh, I won't interfere with your relationship with your broker. Sometimes I talk to people and they say, thank you. Thank you, Dolly. Thank you. Um, sometimes I'll talk to people and they'll ask me a question and I'll go, you really need to talk to your broker, find out your broker's position on that. So like, I'll never interfere with Steve. You know, if Steve tells you to do something, listen, you need to listen to Steve. Okay. Um, I've got uh, people, I've got somebody right now, I've got to respond or I'm, I feel obliged to respond. They have a question before they write an offer on a property. And it's like, well, you need to really talk to your broker about that. I, I can handle general questions. I'll do that. Um, or I'll give you citations to go look at. Um, but again, it's a broker. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Judy. Um, it's a broker driven thing. Um, you're, I remember we hired uh, an agent. Uh, we had met with her. She uh, was going to, uh, she was presenting an offer on a listing that we had. And so uh, uh, I said, well, you know, we're sitting down at a Starbucks in Oceanside. And, and finally, you know, I just, I, I knew I was in a, an area. She was trying to present her offer to the seller, but I knew that we were in an area that really did require the the broker to give her advice. And I said, well, what did your broker say? And she, she responded. She says, every time I asked, she'd been in real estate for uh, 14 years. I'll never forget it because um, I always look people up, right? And so uh, uh, she said, well, every time I asked my broker a question, the broker said, says, you know, that uh, you've been in the real estate for 14 years, you should know the answer to that. And I went, what? And so they're the broker, you're the salesperson, right? Well, of course, uh, um, you know, that that's an interesting position for the broker to take. Um, and, the, and the broker had much less experience than she did, but the broker is responsible. And the broker is liable. In fact, we call them the responsible broker. Okay. So, or the broker of record, they are responsible for you. Ultimately, they ended up, the transaction didn't come together and she ended up actually joining our office, but uh, we weren't looking for that. We don't solicit agents. We don't do that. You know, it's something they got to figure out on their own. But, you know, at the end of the day, it was really, I just, I thought, wow, what an interesting statement to make. Um, um, uh, yes. Uh, send me an email. I will let you know who I use for uh, our property inspections. I don't know if your question is really property disclosures, NHD, um, but you send it to me, I will tell you. And I will tell you in those terms, I will say, this is who we use. We've got good relationships with these people. They're vetted with us. We don't get any money from them. We have no affiliated business with anybody, uh, no escrow, no title, no nobody, um, but we do have recommendations. And so we, we have a, an approved vendor list um, uh, but on that approved vendor list, we're going to give the buyer or the seller the choice of three. Um, so uh, we don't tell them one. If we tell them just one and something goes wrong, then we're going to be we could be subject to uh, negligent referral, which is an actionable item. Um, a quick definition of statutory or, or contractual disclosures. Statutory disclosures are those disclosures required by law. Contractual disclosures are those disclosures required by contract. Two different things. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Holly. Thank you. Good to see you again. I actually can't see you, but thank you so much for being here. Uh, Judy, uh, Steve is an awesome broker. I love Steve. Steve's awesome. He really is. Uh, and he's always available. I had I had a call from somebody. It's been a couple of years now. Where's your? I said, where's your broker? They said, well, they're traveling around Europe. Uh, you know, on on vacation. Well, how long have they been on vacation? Only a year and a half now. And I'm like, well, who answers your questions? So, you know, so I can't help you after that. You know, listen, I'm not getting in front of your broker, that's for sure. But uh, yeah, the, I thought it was pretty funny. Uh, yes, I meant property inspection companies. Yes. Um, John Hasty, who was countywide uh, inspections, you know, he was on my, on my list. And of course, John was always at the top of the list and he passed away about two years ago. Now I really loved him. He did hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of investigation of inspections on properties. He was so good. He was a master, uh, you know, of it. And, uh, I, I knew I was always, even, even with the light hanging down on the cord, uh, that was the last time I ever saw him make a mistake. And in all the transactions where he represented the buyer, I had only one problem ever. And that 
that was uh, the my client was a judge, the buyer was a judge, um, and he was looking to get the money back from the uh, you know the cost of the inspection because he had bought five properties and he figured that the inspector should have done one for free, um, and so he complained about a leaking kitchen faucet, and and John just cut him a check, said go away. Um, you know, it's interesting to note that that judge ended up doing uh, time in federal court uh, or federal uh, prison uh, for uh, unrelated issues. But, uh, you know, sometimes folks, you know, you're not, you know, those who enforce the law are not necessarily above it. Um, uh, and Steve thinks you're a great guy. Uh, Steve's awesome. He really is. I, I, I always have the pleasure of working with him. Steve is the uh, vice chair of the Sergeant at Arms Committee for the California Association of Realtors. And uh, and he's been in a repeat uh, cycle on it. Um, and uh, and he's really a super guy. He's the kind of guy who just never asks. You know, he just does. Right. And he's just really good that way. He's got he's really quick on his feet. He's uh, uh, he's very knowledgeable. and He's actually a really good leader, I think. Uh, so uh, yeah, um, uh, yes. Uh, anonymous, send me. Uh, um, uh, I'm more than happy to give you our approved vendor list. These are the people we like to work with, um, and it keeps me honest. I got to keep updating it. Um, and some people fall off of it because they're just not reliable. Um, but for the most part, it's pretty good. So uh, anyway, so um, Sharon, hi Sharon. Um, oh, thank you so much. That's so very kind. Um, all delivered in a manner allows us to remember it all. If you ever have an issue, please let me know. Okay, send me an email. I mean, it's really just that simple. Um, you know, let SDAR know if you want to teach other classes or send me an email, but copy them or I'll send them your email or whatever. Uh, but I get some great suggestions for classes and they've got me booked for the rest of the year. So, uh, you know, somebody asked me the other day if I could uh, would come do stuff for their office. And I do stuff for people's offices all the time. Um, you know, specific stuff, you know, I'll do a thing for your brokerage firm. Um, uh, but Tuesdays, Thursdays, uh, I'm, I'm 10 to 12 and two to four. So those times are committed, but listen, I could do this all day long. I really could. I, I, I want you to be okay. And as I always say, if you look good, you make me look good. I really want you to look good. And you are here today raising the bar that other people need to attain uh, and, and need to go to. Because you know what? I think we, we, uh, we need to continue to educate ourselves. You always have those breaks in between transactions, but you're never so busy that you can't learn something new. And I tell people all the time, I learn something new every day. And every time I put one of these webinars together, I learn new stuff. I learned new stuff about the lead-based paint, and I've got a graduate certificate in hazardous materials management. I have the original primer from the uh, EPA. I uh, just found it in my garage. I can't even believe. That's one of those things you just don't throw out, right, from when I got my degree back uh, in 93, right before I got my, we went to law school. But uh, I thought I was going to be an environmental attorney. I just knew by the time I got to my last semester in law school, I was not going to go become an attorney. I had no interest in it whatsoever. And by the way, my business plan quadrupled. I mean, uh, the, all my clients are doctors, lawyers, engineers, law enforcement, everybody that's sort of systems approach. So uh, uh, again, I want you to share in that. Hopefully you can do that. You know, you, you do that too, but I will help you in any way that I can. That's what I do. Um, but Sharon, thank you for those kind words. And so, so everybody, again, uh, you know, I don't want to take up more of your time, um, but uh, if there's anything I can do to help you, please send me an email. If you're not getting the newsletter, um, I put some good stuff in there and uh, if nothing else, but the direct links to my classes so that uh, you can just click on it, sign, signs you up for the class, you avoid the message that says the class is sold out. So again, Master My Farm Thursday morning, um, winning listing presentation uh, Thursday afternoon. I'm very excited. I'm probably going to redo those again. Um, so thank you all very much for being here today. I wish you the very best. And so, as I always say from uh, my hometown of Del Mar, I look forward to seeing you all around the track. Thank you for being here. And, uh, and please let me know anything I can do uh, to help. And so uh, we have always heard that the real estate industry is all about location, location, location. Uh, but I think for realtors, it's all about education, education, education. You're preaching to the choir, Judy. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, my first five years in real estate, I took every class I could get my hands on. And so as a result, I just started doing all these transactions and people would say to me, say, how are you doing all these transactions? And I said, I thought everybody did this, right? So get educated, get good at what you do. I'll help you if I can. And, and, uh, and again, thank you, everybody. Take care for now. Hopefully I get to see you again on Thursday. Be good. Bye-bye now.